Well, it's great to be here. I hope everybody can hear me all right. Now, what's going on with this? I don't want this off of here. Okay. One time I was doing a presentation and a computer tried to update the virus software five times during my talk. And it would get going halfway across. I said, oh, no, you don't. You're not doing that now. And then 15 minutes later, it would do it again. Okay. I want to talk about some really basic things about animal behavior. Calm animals are easier to handle. This applies to every kind of animal. If an animal gets really upset, it's going to take half an hour for it to calm back down. Well, instead, people fight it. You know, let it calm down for half an hour. It's really especially important with big animals, but even with a dog. Just let it calm down, or a cat. Give it a chance to calm down. Now, if you want to understand animals, you've got to get away from language. They live in a sensory-based world, a world of sound, touch, smell, taste, vision. It's not in words. And people often ask me, well, how do you know that? Well, if you look at how the brain is built, there's no other way the animal's brain can store information since it doesn't have words. So I want you to shut your eyes and try to get away from language. What is it seeing? What is it smelling? You know, Think about it, when the dog checks the local tree out and he's getting all the uh, p-mail messages there, um, there's a lot of information on the tree. Who's been there? Friend or foe? How long ago they were there? It's a trip down to the coffee shop. <laughs> now, as a person with autism, I often get asked, well, how did, animal, uh, how did autism help me with animals? Because I'm a total visual thinker. The movie did a great job of showing how I think in pictures. You know, everything I think about, there's a picture. You know, if I'm just thinking about uh, only election or something like that, I'm going to start seeing election posters. Because if I don't have pictures, I don't have any thought. It's totally in pictures. Understand animals, you've got to get into sensory details. You need to get away from verbal language. It's a world of sensory details. Now, there's evidence in people when they get a certain type of Alzheimer's called temporal lobe dementia that as language is wrecked, art talent comes out. See, in the normal human mind, things like music, and art, that's underneath language. In fact, uh, animals communicate a lot with tone of voice. You know, if you went up to your dog and you went, good dog, good dog, don't think he's going to react very well to that. You know, they react very much to the tone of voice. You know, you want to watch the body postures. Look at how the zebra and the horse have an ear on each other, and the other ear is on me taking the picture. Watch what the ears are looking at. What's your animal looking at? What kind of postures does it have? I mean, if a dog is putting its butt up in the air, and that's a play battle. He wants to play. If the whole butt's wiggling, he's really happy. If just the tail's wiggling and he's stiff, uh, that's not so good. And horses and cattle tail swishing is a sign of anxiety. That's the warning before you get kicked or bucked off. Where in dogs, it means they're happy. Now look at how that animal's looking right at that bright blob of sunlight. Some of the very first work I ever did with livestock was to get down in the chutes, see what the cattle were seeing. And they're afraid of a lot of little things we tend to not notice. I always get asked, do they know they're going to get slaughtered? I had to answer that question early in my career. I still get asked that question. A bunch of people wrote on the Google search thing to my website, uh, do animals know they're going to die? That actually came back on the printout from my website. Well, I needed to answer that question 35 years ago. So I went out to the Swift plant, and I watched the cattle go up the chute. Then I watched cattle going up the chute at the feedlot for veterinary work. They behave the same way in both places. If they knew they were going to die, they should be jumping out of the chute at the swift plant, and they weren't. Only had a five foot six inch fence, the cattle were very capable of jumping out, but they didn't. They're more worried about reflections. There's a chain hanging down. It's too dark. You get rid of these things that scare them, then they walk right up there. The normal human mind ignores the details, like chains hanging down in the chute. Why, after 35 years, do I still have to show this slide? Because people don't take them out. Now, my books on animal handling, I've got a whole checklist. I've got a checklist in animals and translation. All the things you've got to look for. Because people need those checklists. They don't tend to see things. I get down in the shoots and see what they're seeing. You see, on a real sunny day, you're going to have shadows in there. 
cloudy day, you're not going to have shadows. So you can get time of day effects. Animals tend to go towards the light. So at night, I can use a light to attract a horse into the horse trailer. Now in the daytime, they're not going to go into the blinding sun. You don't like driving down the highway in the blinding sun. Well, they don't want to walk towards that either. You can see people outside the fence. So I might need to cover it up the solid side unless the cattle are completely tame. Now, how does an animal form a concept? Or how does a person with autism form a concept when I got all these very specific pictures floating around in my mind? You sort pictures into categories. It's what's called bottom-up thinking. That's why it's so important when you're training your dog. Let's say you teach him to sit. If you only teach him to sit in your kitchen, he may think it only, only applies in the kitchen. You need to teach him at, well, out on the lawn, at the park, at the school, in a bunch of different places, he is expected to sit. Then it will start to generalize, because that's bottom-up thinking. A concept is formed by specific examples. Language-based thinking, you tend to think top-down, and you tend to drop out the details. Something, this has gotten rid of some of my slides. No, I guess not. I thought the computer had blown off some of my slides. Uh, the thing is, is that cattle perceive a man on foot and a man on a horse as two totally different things. You see, it's a different picture. You can have cattle that have a flight zone of two feet, and they're tame when you ride a horse. And when you get on foot, if they're not used to that, they might have a 100-foot flight zone. You get the same thing with a horse. You see a man on the back and a man on the ground. That's two different things. So you can have a horse that maybe got abused by the horseshoer. He's going to be really horrible for anything you do on the ground, but maybe fine for riding. Or you can have just the opposite. You see, it's like different file folders. See, when you think in sensory, it, it's uh, very specific. On the back, on the ground, two totally different things. A dog can have two different categories. When I'm on the leash, I protect my owner, and when I'm off the leash, I can go play. Two different categories. Um, I know a guy who uh, hauls cattle, and he spends a lot of time on the road sleeping in his sleeper, and he has a dog that really guards that sleeper. One time a thief tried to rob the sleeper when he was there, the dog just bit them all up. And so when he, he goes in the shop, you know, the mechanics don't want to get chewed up. You know what the mechanics do? They call the dog out of the cab, and then the dog's all friendly. When he's in the cab, I protect. When I'm outside the cab, I don't protect. He doesn't have quite enough association to realize, well, maybe after he's called out of the cab, the truck could be stolen. <laughs> but that's how the mechanics learn how to deal with the dog when the driver wasn't around. They just say, come on. Get out of the cab, and he does. Now, here's a horse that was afraid of black cowboy hats because he was abused by somebody wearing a black hat. A white hat was okay, but a black hat was bad. Now, when I put the hat on the ground, it was less scary. But then as the hat got closer and closer and closer to my head, it got more and more scary. You see, you're getting a match for the picture. It's a picture. Now, there's no way... I can get rid of all the black hats in the world. You know, we're going to have to try to work on getting the horse over this. I saw kind of a horrendous video the other day on a cell phone where a barrel racing horse had cracked up in the barrel. And it was the second time this had happened. Because the first time it happened, it tripped going around the barrel. Now it got afraid of it. And it came up there and it just slammed on the brakes. And I think that barrel racing career for that horse may just be over with. It's going to be too hard to train it. I said, use it for some other class. It will be fine, because the fear memory, memory tends to be extremely specific. Now you can get some dogs that get thunder, thunderstorm fears. Well, try to uh, reward confident behavior. You know, if he's cowering in a corner, don't run up to him. But if he wags his tail a little bit or something, then go up and pet him and stroke him, because that rewards the confident behavior. And another little trick is don't pat him, stroke him, stroke him, stroke him. Remember, light tickle touches, no, 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 stroke them. Don't pat them. Now, I had a big black purse that looked like that, that I have a good feeling that maybe the black hat horse would have been afraid of that purse. Kicking myself, I didn't try it. I spent an hour on purse websites just to find that purse. <laughs> but the point I'm trying to get, get here is that 
similar shaped objects, like the black neck pillow or black purse, might set off the same thing. I'm pretty sure if I put it on my head, that would be bad. Now, here are some other examples of specific fear memories. A dog will sometimes get afraid of the place where it was hit by a car because that's what he was looking at the instant he got hit. A horse may be calm with one type of bit and with another type of bit going berserk. Think about it. If you take different kinds of bits and you hold them in your hands and you close your eyes, they're different feeling pictures. Now that's a situation where I can fix the behavior simply by getting rid of the feared bit because I can control what bits put in the horse's mouth. Dogs can recognize the voices of the good and the bad people. And an unfortunate generalization that a lot of dogs make is girls are good and guys are bad. Hate to say it, guys, but oftentimes it's the guy that does something really awful to the dog. Or maybe the dog might get afraid of guys with beards. Or maybe he might get afraid of Nike-type sneakers. Because what do you think he's looking at when somebody beats a you-know-what out of him? You've got to think about what was the animal hearing or seeing right, the moment that something really bad happened. And then there was a horse that was afraid of anything that was long and straight. Now that's a really awful bit. Well, I went on the internet, I got to find some really terrible bits. And if a horse's mouth has been chopped up with one of these, I mean, you absolutely should not use this. But that's likely to make a horse afraid of every jointed snaffle bit. You know what? Let's just get rid of the snaffle bits. This one's going to be easy to fix. This is why when you're solving behavior problems, you need to know the handling history of the animal. Too often times, people are not specific enough when I'm discussing these things. You know, they'll say, well, my horse goes berserk, or my dog's crazy. I don't know what that means. Horse went berserk. Well, I started questioning this lady, and she said a horse went berserk, and it turned out that the only place the horse went berserk was when they put him in the cross ties. I said, yeah, that horse had an accident in the cross ties. You know what, you don't need to use the cross ties. Let's get rid of it. You know, there's a... You know, now I realize that in every fear situation I can't do that. If you have a dog that's afraid of guys, I'm going to have to work on desensitizing that. But what you want to do is reward that confident behavior, try to get the dog to do fun things, get his mind off of it. Sometimes that works. Okay, two different kinds of bits here. They feel completely different. Now a horse got afraid of things that were long and straight. Okay, canes, microphone stands, shovel handles, these are all things that are long and straight. And what had happened to this horse is he'd flipped over another cross tie accident. Don't leave him alone in the cross ties. And the horse fell over backwards and this big fat lead rope went right down his stomach like this. A long straight thing. So now long straight stuff was bad. Now that's not a horse, but at least the stick's horizontal. Would that be, would that be scary? But I might, might, that might not be. You might turn it horizontal. It might be all right. Now, another horse was scared to death of naked white saddle pads. If you put a saddle on top or any kind of tack on top, then it was fine. Think about it. It's a different picture. This horse had probably been roughly sacked out with naked white saddle pads. They certainly wouldn't have tack on top. They were flipping it all over the horse. Well, I can probably get this out of the horse's life pretty easily. Now, first experiences with new things should be good. Because if first experiences with new people or new places are bad, it makes a very bad impression. Let's make sure that when we first introduce the horse trailer, nothing bad happens. Let's make sure the first veterinary trips are nice. The problem with fear memories is you can train the brain to close a fear memory, but you can't totally erase it. And the more high-strung and nervous the genetics is, the harder it is to get the animal over the fear memory. And really flighty animals need to be habituated much more gradually to new things. New things have to be introduced in smaller steps. A real common thing people say to me is my dog or my horse was fine at home and it just went totally scared crazy at a show. There's a lot of new things at a show it hasn't seen before, like flags, bikes, and balloons. And the best way to train that animal to tolerate those things is let it voluntarily approach. Don't jam it in its face. This is just to show you some stress. When you force an animal in a handling situation versus an animal voluntarily cooperating with handling. The dairy cow has a much lower level of stress because it voluntarily cooperates with handling. 
One of the principles right now in low-stress cattle handling is to train animals to go through the handling facilities, making sure those first experiences are good. Sometimes we have to do things that are painful, but we don't want them to think the corrals are bad. You know, so you want to have good first experiences. And then you've got deer that got netted. And I've had wildlife biologists say to me, well, that can't be very stressful. We only held it down for 30 seconds. And I said, well, if you got mugged when you went out of here and somebody knocks you over and steals your wallet in the parking garage, I can guarantee you're going to be really, really super stressed over that. <laughs> Even though it might have only taken 15 or 30 seconds for them to grab your purse and knock you down. You see, that's fear stress. And then down there below, we trained antelope to cooperate with their blood sampling. This is the animal that, that everyone said was untrainable because they were so flighty. It took 10 days to train this animal to tolerate sliding door going up and down. The first day, we moved it an inch, the lunch, and it orients. Well, that was the training for that day, because you don't want to push past that orienting. But we trained them. We've trained pronghorn, nyella, and bongo. Supposed to be untrainable. Now people are doing this. I just read in, the, um, in one of the magazines I was reading on the plane that an okapi now has had a calf. Uh, you know, you just have to do it very gradually. Don't scare it. It was a very nice copy. I stroked it when I visited it at the zoo. It was nice and soft and silky, and, and uh, they wanted to reward him with these bok choy stuff. Well, you got to feed him a treat, <laughs> not, not celery. <laughs> I, hand, I held out the bok choy, and he goes, I don't want to eat this. And, and, and uh, they were so worried about messing up his diet, I said, well, just a teaspoon of grain isn't going to hurt him. It can be a very, very small amount, like a half a sugar cube or something. But a treat's got to be a treat. <laughs> well, we got these antelopes trained where they'd go in this box, and we could do blood sampling, and we could do injections. But their thinking's very specific, because in the pronghorns, the students got them so well trained, they could walk up to them in the pen, and you could stick an IV right in them here. Just go walk right up, no restraint, stick an IV in, in the vein. Well, then the student got cocky, and one of the animals got a little sick, and she tried to do an antibiotic shot in the so shoulder. It went completely berserk. You say, think about it. In the shoulder, different feeling, different specific sensory picture compared to here. It was trained for here. It wasn't trained for here. You see that pronghorn, no, they were hyper, hyper, hyper specific. You know, when we first got them, Canada geese flew over the pen in one direction. They might learn that. That was okay. Then when they flew over another direction, they were freaking out. And then eventually, they got used to them flying over in different directions. And big objects that moved suddenly were especially bad. I'll tell you a little thing that happened down on the movie site. These, they had a trained Haldebrook heifer to use for publicity pictures, and this heifer was fine, all the equipment, white panel trucks, you know, no problem, all these trucks and vehicles and cameras and stuff, just fine. And we were going to just take a publicity picture with her, and the next thing I know, the heifer's rearing up, going to jump on top of me. And they had moved a four by eight white reflector board, just like that, sudden movement. Well, a white reflector board doesn't move and look the same as a white panel truck. Animal doesn't make that kind of generalization. You know, I was kneeling down to get the uh, heifer to lick me, and uh, next thing I know, she's rearing up and on top of me. And this was a trained Alderbroke heifer. All right, what can we do at the vet's office to make things nice? We've got to give animals a non-slip floor. Let's get a bath mat with a rubber backing to put on that table. You know, get a bath mat your puppy knows, and then you, put, you bring that in, and the vet doesn't have to clean it. It's got to have a non-slip floor to stand on. That's really important for horses, too. Lots of times animals go nuts on single animal scale because it's slipping and sliding around. Jerky motion scares. Jerky motion. Well, seeing it or feeling it. You grab a cat like that, it's not going to react very well. There's also an optimal pressure. You've got to make it feel held, but not so tight that it hurts. And the mistake that people make is squish it tighter when it struggles. You've also got to support the body. Don't trigger the fear of falling. If it starts to feel off balance, it's going to panic. The fear of falling is a primal fear. I'm amazed at the things I've been able to fix with a non-slip floor. It is just amazing. That works for all species of animals, all the little ones, all the big ones, and everything in between. 
Do animals have emotions? And the thing that's interesting about the research on emotion is it's all in the neuroscience literature. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of papers on this. And very little of it in the veterinary and the animal science literature. You still got people that want to say, well, animals don't have emotional states. Well, that's kind of weird because they got the same basic emotional drivers that we have. Prozac works on dogs. Let's just look at facts here. Works on dogs the same way it works on people. The neurotransmitters are the same. Basic emotions like fear, located in the subcortex of the brain. Circuits have been mapped. Hundreds and hundreds of refereed scientific articles. See, one of the problems that we have in science and in many, many different things is everybody just stays in their own little hole. You know, different disciplines don't communicate. And I think in this world, the internet's getting worse. I saw a really, really interesting analysis of tweets uh, by people from different political parties. And they had a computerized program picking up keywords, analyzing millions of tweets in the United States. Guess what? Republicans talk to Republicans. Democrats talk to Democrats. <laughs> and it was hor horrible in, t in, in terms of the lack of crossover. You know, you've got to make the effort to go outside your discipline. Well, I like my news both ways. So I get the Wall Street Journal for the right, and I get the New York Times for the left, because I like to read both. I'm only one of the few little lines that goes between the two different things, because that's how you really learn about all kinds of things in the world. OK, now here are the core emotions. Uh, Jack Panskep, uh, who's now at the Washington State, first uh, you know, wrote about, you have fear. Fear circuits have been totally mapped. Then you have rage. That enables an animal to fight off a predator. Then you have separation anxiety. And that's a separate circuit. Like when you take the baby and the mother apart and, the, and they're both getting very upset about it, that's a separate emotional system from fear. But now you can't just have negative emotions. So you've got to have some positive emotions. Animals like to explore. You know, that's why if I took some flags and I decorate the pasture with them, the horse is going to go up to it. That's the seeking arts, the you know, wanting to explore. And then you've also got sex, and you've got mother-young nurturing and play. Now, when I was taking psychology back in the 60s, there was an experiment where they stuck an electrode in the thalamus of a cat and got a big rage reaction. But back there, in my general psychology book, they called it sham rage or fake rage. And the reason why they called it fake rage was back in the era of all the B.F. Skinner behaviorism, you know, the scientist was afraid that his research would just be totally discounted unless he called it fake rage. It wasn't fake rage. It was real rage. And they did a very clever experiment to show it was real rage. Okay, so stimulate the thalamus. And I give the cat a stuffed rat. It will attack a stuffed rat. It will not attack a styrofoam square block the same size as a rat. That shows me that maybe it's not fake rage. Now, researchers have actually found a switch in the brain. They can switch back and forth between fear and seeking. OK, so we go back to that dog that's scared of that thunderstorm. Let's get the seeking system turned on. So you can either be in seek mode or fear mode. Now, if you have an animal that's genetically flighty, the switch is weighted more towards fear. If you have an animal that's been horribly abused, this, the biochemical switch gets weighted more towards fear. But it's either one or the other. I had a situation where a board flew off a, a, a trailer when I was driving on the highway. And um, I locked onto that board like a fighter jet radar. And I moved the car over to avoid it. I wasn't scared at all. But the instant I had successfully avoided getting killed by this board, the switch flipped, heart pounding, swear words coming out. <laughs> I'm not going to repeat any of the swear words. And look at how those animals are approaching that clipboard. And then when the wind blows the paper, they run away. <laughs> that paper stops blowing, they come back. And back when we did this back in 1998, I'm going, it's like a switch. Well, the thing that's interesting is the switch has been found. OK, why were scientists studying this? Drug addiction research. Yeah, I put a drug addict in the brain scanner and show him pictures of the casino. The dopamine circuits are going off like crazy. OK, see how that animal's orienting? When it orients, it makes a decision. Do I keep watching? Do I run off? Do I graze? 
One ear on the camera, the other ear is checking the forest out. When we were training those antelopes, we had to be very careful not to push past this orienting phase, or you'd have them splatting against the wall. When you're troubleshooting a behavior problem, you've got to figure out which emotional system is driving the behavior. There's some different species differences. In primates, if I hug the person around here, people in primates, that's lovey-dovey and nice. But in dogs, when you put your hand up across here, that's dominance. Most domestic dogs tolerate it. But if you go on the internet and you type in kids hugging dogs, right across this part here, that mouth's going to be clamped shut. Now, if you look at the two books out there on the book table in Animals in Translation, there's a picture of a nice, relaxed, open mouth. That's a very relaxed, calm dog. The other book has got the dog with the mouth closed. Now, the dog's not like really scared, but the mouth is closed. It's just not totally relaxed. And most of those internet pictures, the mouth is closed because it's hooked up to kind of the nurturing in primates, but in dogs, it's hooked up to another system, you know, this different emotional driver there. You've got to figure out what's driving it. Should the owner be present at the vets? It depends. Now, we don't have a very happy dog there. Look how you got the white eyes showing there. You see the whites of the eyes on the animal. That's a not, not a relaxed animal. Now, if it's some little frightened animal and the owner can calm it down, then the owner should be there. What if it's a drug dealer's guard dog? Should the drug dealer be there? Absolutely not. Because in that situation, that dog's going to want to protect the druggie against the vet. Okay, what if it's the policeman's side dog? It's going to depend upon how it's trained. If it's been specifically trained that when you have the Kong toy in your mouth, you can let strange people touch you, then the police officer should be there. Otherwise, he needs to be five miles down the road. You know, in both of these situations, either the drug dealer or the police officer, they've got to be five miles down the road, not in the lobby. In a regular small vet clinic, the dog will know that the car hasn't left. They can hear that. So he, you've got to totally get rid of them. Down the road, good and far away, unless it's a huge, huge, huge hospital. You've got to do that. The dog will know he's there. Okay, let's say we got the dog licking its paw. Why do they do that? Separation anxiety. A lot of dogs don't handle being home alone very well. There are genetic differences in how well they tolerate this. If you have this problem, teach the dog to tolerate increasingly long periods of time away from you. You know, starting out very short periods of time, you can sometimes desensitize it. And then there's somewhere, you know, maybe you need to leave it with a neighbor. Okay, you've got the leopard that's pacing. Those animals are big seekers. You know, think about what the animal does in nature. Leopards, big seekers. Oh, you've got to give them things to do. Gerbils and hens, you've got a lot of uh, stereotypic behavior motivated by fear. There's a, there's a research that was done on gerbils. Gerbils are digging and digging and digging in the, in the cage in your kid's bedroom. So you go, oh, we'll give him more dirt to dig in. He doesn't want dirt, he wants cover. He's got to get cover from the non-existent aerial predators that are in your kid's bedroom. You see, that's an instinctual behavior. So you've got to give him something to get under. How about a piece of cardboard? Yeah, that might be all he needs. The hen is motivated to get a private nest box because out in the wild, Hens that laid their eggs in secluded places, they survived to get, hatch their chucks. Hens that laid their eggs in the clearings, foxes just ate them. Well, the hen that hid was the hen that survived. Dogs, we're going to need a lot of um, interaction with people. We bred dogs to be highly social. We bred dogs to really tune into our emotional states. They need a lot of seeking. You've got a lot of high energy dogs. They need tons and tons of exercise. And they don't do very well locked up in the house all day. And they wonder why they chewed the house up all day. One of the big problems we've got, like down in Fort Collins, Colorado, is we got draconian leash laws. You know, like if you go to the field where Cheryl, my assistant, goes to the field in front of the church, the bike cop comes and gives her a ticket if the dog's off the leash. Well, it makes it really hard to do things with the dog. You know, you've got to go to the dog park or you've got to go up in the reservoir and you've got to be on the left-hand side of the road you can have them off at least right-hand side of the load, the, the, the bike cop will get you. Well, this is actually causing behavior problems. Because when I was a child, we didn't have any behavior problems with dogs. They ran loose. Lots of them got killed by cars. That was really bad. 
But the trade-off here is you didn't have behavior problems because they got socialized. They got socialized to toddlers. It's extremely important that dogs get socialized to toddlers. They gotta learn these little people are people. You don't want the little people being in the prey drive folder. That could get extremely, extremely dangerous. And then the older dogs socialize the younger dogs. You've got socialization between dogs with many different people. And, and so they, the other thing is, when I was a child, you didn't have people deliberately breeding aggressive dogs, deliberately breeding dogs for aggressive traits. That was something that didn't go on during the 50s. But when I was a kid, we had three rules for animals. Don't pet a dog you don't know. Don't bother them when they're eating. Don't go up to them and just wake them up suddenly. And if a dog bit somebody, the parents would go, what did you do to it? That's what they did. <laughs> now that golden retriever right there is a really good example of a really nice, relaxed, open mouth. Patricia McConnell's got a wonderful book on animal emotions. She's got great pictures showing all the different postures so you can read your dog better. When you see that nice, soft, open mouth like that, it's not panting, that's very relaxed. Horses, we gotta habituate them to new things carefully so, and we gotta prevent fear memories. As a species, they're more flighty and fearful than, than a dog. And there's a lot of variation, much, much variation. I hate rough training methods. And you do rough training methods to an Arab, you're probably going to ruin the Arab because it's going to just stay scared. You know, people that tend to favor rough training methods tend to use the calmer types of horses. They need grazing. We can prevent a lot of cribbing by not feeding colts so much grain, get them out in the pasture, and they need to interact with other horses. Polar bear, high seeker. What does it do out in the wild? It walks. You know, horses tend to get mouth stereotypes cribbing on things, chewing up wood. Polar bears get walking stereotypes. It's a big seeker out there in the wild. Now, animals that are reared alone often fight other animals in a really, really bad way. Dogs reared alone, singleton puppy reared alone, never interacts with other dogs. They'll try to eat up every other dog and kill it. Horses reared alone, they're awful. We tend to make stallions nuts by locking them up in solitary and, and keeping them in a fancy stable and sort of like supermax for stallions, and then you wonder why they're nuts. Uh, the best way to have animals that don't have behavior problems is to rear them in social groups. Right there, this guy, the dairy bull, he's the number one cause of fatalities with livestock. Horses is the number one cause of injuries, but this guy causes fatalities. Now, why is the dairy bull bad? Because he's reared alone. If you rear him alone, then when he gets to be 18 months to two, he thinks he's a person, and then he, the hormones kick in, and he views you as rivals for mates. The best way to make him safe is to rear him with a lot of other cattle. It's a mistaken identity issue. It's not tameness. It's mistaken identity. You rear him with a bunch of other cattle, and he's not going to care about attacking people. You want him to grow up knowing that he's cattle. You know, there's a lot of learning here, and their identity is based on who they grow up with. I had a hideous situation. Well, about 20 years ago, I bought a piece of land outside of town, 25 acres, came with a black horse on it. Very nice, tame black horse. I would have been happy to board him. There was only one problem. He tried to kill every other horse he put on that pasture. It was hideous. Both back feet kicking, kicking, kicking. It wouldn't stop. Problem is, animal reared alone hasn't learned to give and take a social behavior. He doesn't know when to stop it. I already talked about problems with uh, lack of socialization. Dogs? Okay, in my work with uh, cattle handling and stockmanship, the thing I've learned over the years is about 20% of people are really good stock people. You know, they just naturally get it. And then there's a big bunch of people that are really, you know, that I can train. And then there's about 10% that are just really terrible. They shouldn't be working with animals. But we've but we got to measure handling because we've got to prevent it from going back bad. When I first started out, I thought I could fix everything with equipment. Just build the right equipment. I can only fix half of it. The other half is the stockmanship. So I've developed systems for measuring handling. Measuring handling at the slaughter plant, measuring handling on the ranch. Because if I measure something, I can keep it good. 
and it keeps you from slipping back into bad practices and not realize that you're slipping back into bad practices. One of them is yelling and screaming at livestock. Yelling and screaming at livestock, really, really stressful. Now, there's different kinds of variables you can have for auditing animal welfare. And I've been spending most of my time now working with retailers to develop really simple ways to audit animal welfare, to make sure we keep things good. And one of the best ways to keep things good is to do what's called an animal-based outcome measure. I'm not going to tell you exactly how to run your dairy, but if you've got too many lame cows or too many skinny cows, you're going to get kicked off the approved supplier list. Or if you've um, got cattle falling down and mooing at the slaughterhouse, uh, you're going to get uh, kicked off the approved supplier list for that. These are things that I can measure. So it's called an outcome-based measure. Then there's some practices just ban. Tail dock and dairy cows, let's just get rid of that. And then there's a few input measures. See, the old way of doing it was telling people exactly how to build stuff. You still need a few input things like ammonia levels in buildings, maybe a few space requirements. But I'm not going to tell people exactly how to build dairy stalls. OK, for stockmanship and handling, I can measure how many cattle fall down during handling. I hope none. How many cattle are mooing? We do mooing scoring at the backing plant. If more than three cattle out of 100 vocalize in the stunning area, they fail the McDonald's audit. It's that simple. And when I first started out, some of these plants are horrible. They have 50% of them mooing, 30% of them mooing. That's just terrible. Well, that mooing is an outcome of abuse. Electric prods, doors slammed on them, broken stunner, you know, various bad things. And I only score that during the handling. I don't score it when they're just in the yards because bulls will yak back and forth each other. I don't, you know, score that. You know, but I can measure things, how many fall, how many they poke with an electric pride. That's stuff that's measurable. Okay, here are some signs that an animal, horses or cattle, are getting scared. Whites of the eyes show. Very nice science that shows that animal's scared. How did scientists prove that it wasn't that it's scared? Well, you give it Valium and then, then the whites of the eyes go away, but we can't put them on Valium. That's sort of totally illegal. But it did prove... <laughs> that, that um, the whites of the eyes were caused by fear. Switching tail, that's the uh, faster it goes. Well, horses and cattle will tell you before they blow up. Quivering the skin, sweating in horses, heads up looking all around, ears are moving all around. They'll tell you. They'll tell you they're getting upset, but you've got to read it. Now, sometimes in the slaughter plants, I could fix a slaughter plant with some of the simplest things. Like just putting a light on the dark entrance of a chute. They don't like to go in the dark. So I duct taped a lamp to the chute entrance. And the amount of electric prods that had to be used went from 38% down to 4. Because now the pigs would go in. That's all I did. There's an example of light. But the thing that drives me crazy is that the light breaks and people don't replace the light. <laughs> this drives me really, really crazy. It's hard for some people to understand using behavior rather than force. I just had a plant that made the mistake that was shown in the movie, you know, the slippery ramp going into the dip vat. Well, I have the same kind of ramp going into my center track restrainer system. You've got three plants up here in Canada that have got that. And they went and cut the ramp off and messed the ramp up after the light had been taken off. They need to watch that segment in the movie. Why are they making that same mistake 35 years later? It makes me nuts. And I'm really beginning to realize they're not seeing it. I read all that stuff about the Japanese nuclear power plants burning up. And then I read something that to me was like so obvious as a visual thinker. It was so obvious I would have never have done this. Why would, if you live by the sea, why do you put your crucial emergency generators that run the very important emergency cooling pump in the basement? <laughs> Those big diesels don't work underwater. And that's why... Four nuclear power plants burned up and lost containment and made the biggest mess you ever could have. The generators were put in the basement. And I'm really thinking they didn't see it. We're working on another book right now, and it's strictly on cognition. Because things like taking this ramp off and putting the generators in the basement, I don't think they could see it. But as the visual thinker, I can just see the water coming in there, going on top of the generators. Oh, and then the seawall after it got breached that would have held the water right there on the plant site. I mean, just a gigantic mess. I mean, they didn't have a chance. Okay, 
Another problem area is animals that are hard to handle. Getting the slaughter plants pretty good, but I'm seeing problems where pushing animals too hard. We got, you know, genetically breeding pigs to grow faster and faster and faster and faster, and they got leg problems, or they got arthritis, or they jack them up on too much uh, beta agonist feed additives, and they get weak and lame. We've had some problems with cattle with that, what I call biological system overload, where we just push the biology to the point where I'm getting an animal I can't handle. And then I gotta have an animal that's trained to people on foot. And this is pretty dangerous with cattle to get cattle that aren't trained to people on foot in a meat plant. You want dangerous auction or packing plants, really dangerous. Pigs differentiate between a man in the alley and a man in the pens. You gotta walk your pens. Get them used to people being in there so they don't freak out and go berserk at the plant and they're impossible to handle. In making up guidelines, you've got to get rid of these words like proper, adequate, or sufficient. What do you mean by sufficient space? I was just looking at a guideline today and it talked about sufficient feeder space for dairy cows. I said, why not just write it that there has to be enough space that they can all eat at the same time? You see, that's something I can see that. It's got to be clear. Okay. The principal thing that I like to do is have something where you measure, there's, there's certain things that are really, really important. Like how could I have good animal welfare to dairy if I had 30% lame dairy cows? That's something that's a critical control point. And no matter how good everything else in the dairy was, the welfare of that dairy is not acceptable, that many lame dairy cows. That's super, super critical. Body condition score. Sores and lesions all over. Now the principle is, you've got to pick out the things that are really important. And I put the emphasis on things I can directly observe. It's not a paperwork audit. I'm sure the nuclear power plant had all their paperwork in order. Yeah, they had a backup, and they had a backup, and another backup. But they were all in the basement, so they were useless. <laughs> Just that simple. Now they had all the paperwork. Okay. Here are basic things that would be critical control points for animal welfare on a dairy farm. Body condition score. How many skinny cows, lame cows, filthy, dirty cows, swollen legs, organic. You better make sure they're not full of lice or, or uh, ringworm or something nasty like that. So I'm going to check their coats, ammonia levels in the building, abnormal behavior. You know, I've worked all my life on handling. And I'm really pleased. There's a lot of other people now out doing, you know, low-stress handling. And just to get the handling fixed, now we're getting some of these other problems. Animals that are too weak to handle. Got to give me something I can handle. Now, lameness is a good critical control point. Just look at all the different things that can make them lame. I need to add something to this slide. Beta agonists, ractopamine and sulpanerol. They can also make livestock lame. I need to add them to this list. Not dairy cows. Not dairy cows. That's not given to dairy cows, only to pigs and, and feedlot cattle. Well, I'm going to bash on pets now. I've bashed on farm animals, let's bash on pets. I think this bulldog's a deformed, freakazoid monstrosity. <laughs> That's what it is. Now, if you go on, go on a computer and you type in, into the picture thing on Google, bulldog's dilemma. You can find a picture of a 1938 version of a bulldog. It actually has got some legs, it actually has a muzzle, and it's actually a functional dog. Rather than be this freak that can't breathe, can't walk, and can't have its babies naturally. Well, what people did is they just kept following the verbal breed standard. And this happened slowly. Now, as younger people come in, they think it's normal for the breed to have all this stuff. If these wrinkles get any worse, he's going to suffocate on his own wrinkles. I look at this and I don't think it's cute, I think it's hideous. Okay, and in animals, uh, in, in, in uh, farm animals, I get concerned about, you know, pushing the biology too hard. Well, we're pushing the biology too hard on a bulldog, too. You know, here it's for stupid appearance trait. In farm animals, it's for productivity. I think in farm animals, we've got to start looking at what's optimal. A dairy cow that lasts for only two years of milking, that's not optimal. It takes you two years to grow the heifer. And then you push her so hard that you throw her away after two years of milking. I don't know how they do their counting. I, I really, they must do weird tax stuff because I just don't see how that can pay. Okay, here are some of the things that may cause by pushing 
you know, a farm animal too hard. They can get lame, they can get skinny, they can get weak. Uh, you take these blue-eyed dogs and breed them together. Yeah, they're really pretty until you get the deaf puppies. Uh, the lean line pigs, when they came in in the late 80s, all of a sudden they got porcine respiratory and reproductive syndrome. And uh, there's now been research that shows they're more susceptible to the virus. And now you've got hog farmers putting HAPA filters in the windows of the sow barns. These are the kind of filters you use for the bubble boy, the immunocompromised bubble boy. And you put them in swine building? I don't think that's the right approach to the problem. Maybe we better breed a little hardiness back in, just a little bit, back off a tiny bit on the production. Not a good trade off there. Is that very good food security? I don't think so. You don't have half a filters in an operating room in the hospital. And what happened to those pigs' ears? Well, another pig had them for dinner. This is something that started happening in the late 80s as the lean line pigs came in. Now, fortunately, some parts of the industry now are backing off on this. There's actually getting to be some better genetics. Just as they fixed that, well, then we got ractopamine thrown in there to mess things up. Just as we started fixing the genetics, we also got rid of the horrible PSS pigs which was a very bad genetic stress pro problem. And when, these, these pig, when we bred pigs to be lean, well, accidentally they got bred to be mean. And they like to fight a lot. That's what happened to the ears. Well, that's really pretty, but, you know, a lot of deaf puppies. You overselect for single trait, you are going to wreck your animal. It's just that simple. I don't care if it's a production trait or an appearance trait. I think we've got to look a lot more at optimal things. Well, those are nice, pretty cows, but um, two lactations for dairy cows, that just doesn't make very much sense. I was just down at Utah State University discussing some of the finances on this. And they said, well, she just begins to pay after the second lactation. See, I think this gets into a mindset that a dairy just does milk. They also produce a lot of beef, too. You know, it's like not seeing things. You got to ever think about things that we're not seeing. Sometimes the most obvious is the least obvious. Well, let's, let's go show some books there. Proving Animal Welfare, a Practical Approach. That's aimed at, uh, you know, setting up farm audit systems. Got a book on humane handling for ranchers. Then, of course, those two there. And I want you to look at those two dogs there because uh, that, see how nice that nice relaxed open mouth on animals in translation? You see that, you get a dog that's just perfectly relaxed. Now, the other guy, I'm not going to say he's like deathly scared. But he's just a little anxious when they shut the mouth like that. I want you to watch that. This is one of the things that Patricia McConnell talks about a lot. And I want to try to get you to be a lot more observant of what is your animal looking like? What does it look like? What does it sound like? You know, what is it doing? Be observant. And that's the end of my talk. And we're going to be doing lots of questions. And, and we'll be doing lot of questions out there with the webinar, too. And I guess the... Uh, and if someone come up to handle doing the questions. And thank you all for coming. <laughs> I don't think, I think we, I guess I can take some questions off the floor. I'll repeat them so that, um, People on the webinar can hear them. Okay, right there. Make it fairly short because I've got to repeat it. Can animals be autistic? There are situations where you can get um, autistic-like behavior in animals. And in animals, it comes from putting them in a sensory-deprived environment, you know, like a barren zoo cage. And then the panther's uh, walking around or the dog's uh, home alone chewing up his paw. In, in an animal, it's usually caused by lack, a very lack of stimulating environment, where in autism, one of the things that causes the uh, repetitive behavior is sensory overload. I can remember rocking and dribbling sand through my hands to block out hurtful stimulation. Now, the problem is you let the child block out that stimulation, uh, the brain isn't going to develop. What you've got to do is get them in a quiet place and, and work with them. But I think there's some similarities. Do animals see in colors? Animals are partially colorblind. You take your animals like horses, cattle, dogs, cats, they're all dichromats. They don't see red. See, in normal trichromatic human vision, you've got three color sensors, 
and animals just have two. Now, now there's some animals that there's some exceptions to that. I'll tell you in just a minute. But the, uh, they see yellow very, very well. Yellow, blue, bluish purple really well. Green, don't see, they'll see red as black or gray. And what dichromatic vision does is it gives you better night vision and more sensitivity to harsh contrasts of light and dark. Birds have full color vision and can see ultraviolet. Most of the primates have full color vision so they can determine you know, ripening of fruit. They used to think that animals like dogs and cattle were black and white colorblind. That's not true. Okay, well, they, okay, the question was, if the animal's just sensory, then how come it can learn words like sit? Well, it's just learning it by the, the sound of the word. There's a certain sound means sit. Uh, they can learn, they can learn some, the meaning of some words, but they still are basically a sensory-based thinker. Like if you ask me to think about uh, uh, what I had for dinner last night, I see it. I don't think about that in words. For example, if I ask you, think about a, a, a church steeple, most people get a kind of a vague generalized picture. I just see specific ones. Um, there's different degrees of visual thinking versus language-based thinking. I've run into a few people that think completely in language. And these are people that can see. They have nothing wrong with their eyes. They can drive cars. But, but if they, they, they think completely in language, you see, you know, I find that people that tend to be more sensory thinkers tend to get along with animals better because they can relate to that. Highly verbal thinkers, now, I know there may be exceptions to this, have a hard time understanding how you could even have thought without, um, without language. Vaccines affecting horses or cattle behavior. No, I haven't, unless you've got some kind of a weird allergic reaction or something like that. Okay. Okay, the question concerned cats and shoulders and in cages. First of all, most shoulders are way too noisy. You know, people are asking me all the time, what would we do to um, improve the design of shoulders? Well, noise abatement. That's going to be the first thing I'm going to do. But unfortunately, materials that reduce sound are hard to clean. One simple thing to do is either hang fabric or styrofoam up in the ceiling. You know, now, you've got to make sure it's fireproof. But the, uh, that will absorb a lot of sound. And it's up there out of the way. Even cardboard that hung up there would work, but it wouldn't be fireproof. Uh, a lot of cats get overstimulated. Now, there's quite a few shelters now that have these group housing things for cats. That works well for a lot of them, but you get one little scared kitty that's down the bottom hiding underneath. Uh, that might not be a very happy kitty, one that just kind of cowers down there. Others, it works fine. Dogs need to get taken out every day and played with. I had a student named Krista Coppola, and uh, she was over at a local animal shelter, and every other dog that came in, she tested, got a salivary cortisol sample of them, totally non-invasive. Half the dogs got a training and, a, and play period for 45 minutes the, a day after they came in. The controls just got stuck in a cage when we took salivary cortisols. The next day after that play session, the salivary cortisol was significantly lower. But unfortunately, it went right back up again because the play periods weren't continued. So what does that paper tell you? It was in the Journal of Physiology and Behavior. Dogs need to be taken out every day, 30 minutes to an hour of quality exercise and play time with the person. And then if they're not taken out every day, they can get really miserable really fast. You need a lot of volunteers to do that. But that's what dogs need. They're social. We bred this hyper-social beings, way more social than a wolf is. But I think a lot of cats get overstimulated, too. If the rabbits are considered aggressive, they're fearful. And I think, an, see, a rabbit's a prey species animal. It's a prey species animal, with, uh, and all your prey species animals have the eyes on the side of the head. 
So they can always be looking for danger. And a rabbit's going to be extremely high fear. It's going to be biting out of fear. See, this is what you have to figure out what's motivating it. It's not aggression. It's going to be fear in a rabbit. Have you done any work with just because I haven't really done much, much work with rabbits, but uh, they're, they're a very high fear animal. Because, see, as a species, any animal that's a prey species animal tends to be higher fear. And a rabbit's completely defenseless. And it only survives by running away and hiding and watching out for danger. It is frustrating in the shelters they get deemed as aggressive, but it is their fear. It's fear. They're just afraid. People need to be calmer about it. And, and uh, you know, maybe cover up the cage with a towel, you know. Try to calm things down. There's so much noise and everything in a shelter. It may be on sensory overload. See, this is a problem that autistic kids have. You know, the noise in a supermarket would be like uh, getting put in a barrel and pounded on or being inside the speaker at a rock concert. So it may be overstimulated and scared. So it's just lashing out. Wait a minute, I'm going to take somebody else. You've already had a question. Up there? <laughs> Okay, the question was, is it cruel to keep a cat indoors all its life? Um, a cat that's lived in, indoors all its life doesn't know how much funsies it is to go outside, and they probably adapt okay. A cat that's been an outdoor cat probably isn't going to like it very much. You see, it gets back to what their experiences are. If you have to be at work every day and leave it home alone, a cat handles it a lot better than a dog does. Dogs have a lot more needs. And there's a lot of variations in, in, in cats. If it's grown up as an indoor cat, it's going to be afraid to go outside. Um, I read somewhere once where uh, if you leave your cat alone all day uh, uh, to turn on radio or something on soft music, do you, what do you think about that? OK, the question was, if you leave your cat home all day, you should turn on the radio. It's good to get the animals used to a variety of stimulation. When I was doing research with pigs, we had a radio that we turned on, and we made sure it had a variety of news and music, a whole variety of things. And that prevented the problem of the pigs just going absolutely berserk when a car went by or a plane flew over the, over the place. And it, it, it was really a good thing to do. You know, you want to get animals used to it. You want to get animals accustomed to enough different things so when there's some change, they don't just, you know, completely uh, freak out over it. A lot of training in the courses emphasizes that the uh, person be the alpha. On and horses? Yeah, with, yeah, <laughs> that person. And I wonder if you're a on that because I struggle with it myself. Well, I don't think with a prey species animal you want to just dominate it with force. That's not going to work very well with horses, especially the real high-strung ones. I'm, I'm a big fan of using much more gentle methods of working with horses in animals make us human. Talk about clicker training. See, the advantage you have with clicker training is for teaching an animal something complicated. You don't need to teach, use it for a dog for sitting. I think it's kind of silly. But to teach it something complicated, you can very precisely time when it did something right. Like, let's say I'm trying to teach it to change leads right. If I say, good boy, he's already made like six moves. Where with a click, I can precisely time right when he made the right move. And there's a video by, uh, in a book by a Karen Pryor. She's got a brand new book out. She's also got this video called Clicker Magic. And uh, it's a, mainly it's a dog training video. I just forget about what the species is and look at what she's doing. There's a scene in there where they train a cat to go through an obstacle course. That's the best part of the whole book. But I think we need to, horses as an animal, we need to definitely get away with way, way, way from rough stuff. They just don't react well to that, and they're very easy to ruin. And the more genetically flighty they are, like the Arabs, the more likely you can just ruin the horse. Okay, right there. What do you feel about dentistry and small dogs, like brushing up their teeth? Like, dentistry and small dogs? Well, if you give them enough bones to chew and stuff like that, the teeth would stay clean. And dogs are outside eating all kinds of weird stuff. It stayed clean. Evaluate or assess uh, animals in research, such as at universities. 
animals of research. Have I ever done anything with that? Yes, I have. And I've been in, the, in the pharmaceutical labs. I've been in a number of different labs. OK, they might have beagles in there that they're using. And having those dogs socialized, there's a big difference between different suppliers on how nervous and excitable these beagles are, the ones where they've been socialized. Uh, you know, labs that are really progressive, they let the dogs out, let them play in the hall, and people play with them. Uh, dogs need that. That's really an important thing. Yeah, I actually have, I've actually been out in some labs. And, there's a, and, and the labs are doing a lot of good things. And they're just not telling anybody. They're so worried about getting attacked that they, you know, and a lot of the people that work in labs really care about what they're doing. I have a student, a master's student, that went to work in a lab. And she's in charge of, you know, their environmental enrichment. And, and there's a lot of lab people that really care about what they're doing. And they, and they like the farm stuff, I think they need to be telling what they're doing. I'm really proud of the fact I worked on cleaning up the slaughterhouses. But nobody seems to know about it. And I'm not going to call them harvest plants, because that's stupid. <laughs> Harvesting, you do the grain. There's slaughter plants. And, and, and I found that when I went out to Hollywood, all the Hollywood press wanted to talk about was, uh, well, what are feed yards and how do slaughter plants work? I mean, they were just curious about stuff. OK, right there. Uh, Temple, uh, have you ever worked with, um, let's say, with autistic children that are, have a fear of dogs? And these OK, let's talk about problems with autistic kids and fear of dogs. What I have found with animals and with kids with autism, there's like three kinds. Instant loving them, best buds with the dog, loves the dog, really understands the dog. Then the second kind, a little bit afraid of the dog in the beginning, they warm up to the dog and they really like it. Then there's a third kind, they absolutely hate dogs. And the reason why, it's, it's sensory sensitivity. They're afraid it's going to bark and hurt their ears. And you never know when it might bark or, or the cat might meow or they might not like the smell. It usually is sensory. Which, which for and then some children that have this problem, they're never going to feel at ease around the dog. It's just like, okay, if the smoke alarm's gone off, every time he sees a smoke alarm in a room, he's still getting upset because he's scared it might go off because it blasted his ears out. He's afraid the dog's going to blast his ears out. You see, and then getting into the whole thing about whether or not a service dog is appropriate, I ask people, well, try out the next door neighbor's Labrador. Find out if he likes dogs. You know, it, it's appropriate for one and maybe not for another one. Okay, how about, um, okay, right here. How do I tell the difference between what? If a dog is licking its paw, if it's just cleaning it attentively, or if it has separation. Okay, the dog is just licking its paw, but he has separation anxiety. Well, if he's got separation anxiety really bad, he's going to lick a hole in his paw. You're going to end up having a, a wound there. And you'll know because it's going to be all messed up. And, and of course, you want to do something about it long before it gets to that point. And if you've got a dog that's doing that, chewing up, you know, licking it to the point where it's damaging it, that be a, might be a dog that's not going to handle being home alone very well. You know, you can leave it at the next door neighbors. Maybe sometimes another dog helps. If you can take it to work with you, take it to work with you. But there are some dogs that just don't handle being alone. Then you get into the whole issue of whether you ought to use medication. Well, there's some really serious dogs that might need some medication. But that's not the first thing you could do. And there's gigantic controversy about medication with kids with autism. Way too many drugs given out to young autistic kids, way too casually. And in Thinking in Pictures, and in the second edition of my The Way I See It book, I have a whole section there on appropriate careful, conservative use of medication. OK, you're going to get ready. some from I'll the, get this ready for you. so I can get some of the webinar questions. Oh, OK, we'll do another one while they're getting that ready right here. Livestock transport? Well, one of the biggest problems with livestock transport is putting animals on trailers that aren't fit to transport. You know, old half-dead dairy cows, 
Uh, you got the animals, you gave them too many feed additives or something, made them weak. You got beef cattle, you weaned on a truck and you didn't pre-vaccinate them. And you wonder why they got sick. Uh, animals that are just so wild that, you know, they're difficult to handle, they're going to have a lot more stress, a lot more fear stress. You know, there's a lot of things that can be done to improve transport. Uh, a lot of it's management stuff, and a lot of it gets down to the animal we're putting on the truck in the first place. Day-old bobby calves haul them a real long distance. They're not fit to transport. They can't walk without assistance. Okay, that. Um, well, okay, the subject was welfare at abattoirs. You want to just click on that? No, you don't have to. You read it right there. Okay. What are the critical control points to audit a slaughterhouse? Okay, there's five of them. And to pass the McDonald's audit, a plant has to get a passing score on all five of those critical control points. Okay, if it's beef, you have to shoot 95% on the first shot and make them dead with a single shot. And then the other 5% instantly get another shot before they're hoisted or cut. 100% insensible. You're only allowed three cattle out of 100, Moon and Bellerin in the stunning area. 1% fall, that's scored in the, all, everywhere in the whole entire plant. And you've got to get 75% or more moved with, with no electric prod. Those are the critical control points. And if you're doing electrical stunning of pigs and shape, it has to be placed correctly on 99% of the animals. The entire guideline, you can go on grandon.com and go in my animal welfare um, uh, audit section. Okay, yep, I'll do another one. Uh, do you support Caesar Milan's methods for training dogs? <laughs> Good. In looking at a lot of different training things, different kinds of methods work well with you know, different temperaments of animals. And Caesar Milan's changed a lot. You know, when he first started, he did a lot of real rough stuff. And and I thought he was absolutely horrible with the fear-based behaviors. He didn't know what to do with the fear-based behaviors. He didn't know what to do with separation anxiety type of things. But there's a certain kind of really aggressive, really assertive, you know, definitely not fearful dog, some of these Rottweilers and whatnot, that he actually was really good with. You know, the thing is, one size doesn't fit all. Then you've got other trainers where everything's positive. Everything is positive. Well, real severe aggressive behavior like cat killing, I've looked through a lot of those books at the bookstore and I look up aggression and things like prey drive, uh, they don't, they ignore those issues. You know, it's, uh, you know, in the beginning I thought Caesar got way too rough with a lot of things, but I've watched some of his episodes more recently. Uh, he's got, he's, he's changing and, and his latest book, he actually had some of the other methods in it. People get way too much into just one size fits all. Because there's some brilliant things that he's done with some of the very aggressive, very assertive uh, types of dogs. Okay, we've got clicker training. What do I think of that? Well, in Animals Make Us Human, we've got a lot of stuff in there on clicker training. Clicker training is really, really useful for teaching complicated things. I don't think you need it to teach a dog to sit or to lie. But if you want to teach a horse, like to do that pee off thing where it's got a stand in place and do this, do real fancy kinds of things, uh, teach the cat to go through the obstacle course, it works, it works really well. You see, it, it, there's different tools in the toolbox. And I think a mistake that people make, try to use the same tool for everything. Okay, uh, dogs barking, uh, aggressive dog. Okay, now aggressive dog, that's an example of not giving me enough information. Is it fear biting? You know, because it's just scared? Is it some Rottweiler or a pit bull that wants to take somebody apart? You know, how you're going to deal with these is going to be different. You've got to figure out what is the situation where this is happening. Now, aggression problems with large dogs, you better go to a professional trainer. I'm going to put human safety first. And uh, this is not the venue to be telling you how to deal with uh, aggression in large dogs, where you really get a safety issue. I can't emphasize enough the importance of socializing all puppies to toddlers. Let's make that a very, very good first experience. They've got to learn old people are people. People in wheelchairs are people. Uh, uh, toddlers and 10-year-old boys are people. Because the animal is specific. 
And this could help uh, avoid a lot of dangerous prey drive type of, types of things. You know, I just was talking to someone the other, other day. They had a, I think it was a German shepherd, and uh, he liked to take policemen apart. You know, police uniforms. Well, now you're going you're to get a mailman eaten up because that looks like a, at least U.S. mail uniforms look a lot like police uniforms, and even the hat is similar. Well, that's, um, that's a potentially dangerous situation. If you're in that kind of situation, you better get a professional trainer. Now, one of the places where the professional trainers rip out their hair is that the owners don't do the things that the trainer prescribes. Like, for example, um, you know, make it sit before it eats. Uh, you go out the door first. You know, it's going to have to do things on your terms. Okay, I'll take one from the crowd. Okay, right over here. As far as slaughterhouses go, um, do you think that, that Canada is, is doing well in that area? And do you think there should be more governing over that from other bodies? Is it regulated very well? Well, what's happened on the slaughterhouse thing, you know, the question concern how well Canada is doing is controlling what's going on in slaughterhouses. Now, 25 years ago, Canada was light years ahead of the U.S. Then the McDonald's stuff started down in the U.S. in 1999, and I think the U.S. pulled ahead. Uh, you know, and, that, and now there's, then the government you know, reacts to that. We had that big scandal down there at that Westland Hallmark plant, forklift knocking over dairy cows, and the USDA called that a policy-changing event, and the USDA is getting much more strict now. It's... Uh, and then all the retailers getting on top of it. But the thing that you've got to do is you've got to have regulations that are clear. You know, we're, we're, getting, we're getting a lot better on that. We still have things that talk about minimize agitation and excitement. I don't know how to train an inspector on that. Uh, you, you know, so you've, you've got to get, solve the problem. Inconsistent inspection. We've had problems with this where one inspector was super strict and another inspector was uh, super lax. And we, the interesting thing that our GAO, the General Accounting Office in the U.S., found out uh, a year ago was the big plants were much more even and better controlled than the little plants. See, a lot of the problems you have in the little plants, you've got an inspector that just lives there because you can't move them around because you can't keep making them sell his house. And so I've seen, seen things. I went in a plant two years ago, so filthy I couldn't believe it. It's a little tiny thing. It, it's, uh, you know, things can be done really well. It gets down to management. I'm a big fan of video auditing. Cargill Corporation here in Canada has two plants on video auditing. JBS Swift has video auditing, where video cameras are over the stunning box, they're over the unloading ramp, over the chutes, and there's an auditor in another state tuning in at random and doing the scoring. Boy, that really fixed some things up. And I have been a very, very big proponent of that. Because if you just put video cameras in internally, the novelty wears off. That doesn't work. It's got to be looked at by someone outside. Now, when Cargill first put that in, you know, on the back was turned, the electric prods are out again. Stunning didn't change. Stunning is so dependent on maintenance. That's like, that is really equipment dependent. You've got to maintain your gun. But the um, handling, now it's gotten a whole lot better. Now they have the plants doing contests to see who can get the best handling score, but you've still got to keep the line full. And Because the, the, every plant gets all the scores from all the other plants, so they can see how they're doing. And then, the, then, the, then that each month, the champion plant gets a pizza party, or they get hats or coats or something like that. <laughs> and that's turning, it's just the employees that work the cattle, that's turning it into something positive. Okay, right up there with the paper. <laughs> okay. Um, should we protect our animals, like our pets, from our um, heavier feelings, like if you're upset or angry, should we keep them protected from that? Well, the question was, should you protect your pets, like if you're really angry or really upset? Well, sometimes in those situations, the pet can really comfort you. I mean, the pet kind of tune in on your feelings. Uh, I'd be more concerned about anger around the pet than I would, you know, if you're sad. The pet's going to help cheer you up. Uh, animals are, you know, they'll pick up on your emotions. 
they'll definitely do that. I mean, a little bit of a dog seeing that you sat, I think, is probably not going to hurt the dog any. Okay, let's take something off the computer here. What will it take to influence meat producers who are focused primarily on production to be more concerned about breeding healthy animals? Well, unfortunately, with high grain prices, that gives you economic incentives to do things you shouldn't do. And these ethanol plants, we're putting half the uh, grain into ethanol in the U.S. That was like crazy. Uh, and and uh, this is an example of lobbyists uh, buying an election. It's like really disgusting. Uh, and, it, and then, you, then that, that motivates the feed yard to do stuff like feeding too much beta agonists or doing something else they shouldn't be doing. You see, economics can work to improve animal welfare or it can work to make animal welfare wor worse. The situation where it can improve animal welfare is when you have big customers insisting on standards because a plant doesn't want to get booted off the approved supplier list. That can improve welfare, but things like high grain prices can give the wrong incentives. You have things like somebody puts a screaming ball and calves on a truck. They've got no vaccines. They've got no preconditioning or, or, or pre-handling, uh, pre-weaning, and then they get sick two weeks later. Well, in order to get the farmer to, um, to pre-vaccinate, pre-wean, he needs to get a premium price for that. If the guy that just takes his calves down the auction, dumps them at the auction, gets the same price as somebody that, uh, uh, that just does it badly, there's no economic incentive there to do things right. I did a study, and the first things I ever did, I looked at cattle sold live weight versus cattle sold in the carcass. When cattle were sold live weight, the slaughterhouse paid for all the bruises. When they were sold in the carcass, feedlots paid for bruises. Guess what? The um, carcass weight had half as many bruises. I know how to get rid of bruises. Make people pay for them. That makes, gets rid of them real, real fast. Okay, right there. What's your favorite animal and why? Well, I have to say I think beef cattle is my favorite animal. You know, I, you know, people tend to like the animal that they work the most with, and that's the animal I've worked the most with. Uh, okay, Melissa is asking me here about training collars, I guess on dogs, like electric shock collars. That's probably what she's referring to. Well, for most things, I absolutely hate them. Uh, but there's one situation where you might have to use it, and that's prey drive. See, the problem is killing things is fun. Uh, that's the problem. Dogs like, there are certain dogs that really like to kill things, and there are differences in the amount of prey drive. I mean, I, I talked to a rancher one time where a coyote just came in and killed like 25 lambs just for hacks, didn't eat them, just killed them for funsies. <laughs> it is horrible. So you've got a really bad prey drive situation, like maybe cat killing, sheep killing, and you've got to get it stopped. I don't think there's any positive way to stop that. Now you've got to, this is the only place, I don't want to use a shock collar, I'm going to use it once and I'm going to throw it out. Everything else we can train nice pretty much and you put the shock collar on the dog wears it for several days because I never want the dog to figure out that the collar did it and then you take him out in the sheep pasture and just as he gets ready to bite it zap and he'll think the sheep gods did it <laughs> and and I uh, I don't know, you know you have to set it really high and then he wears it for another couple of days, and then hopefully I can take it off and throw it away, and it's done. You know, but that's one of the few situations where single, very, 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 very harsh correction may have to be done to stop that. Because the problem is, it's so much fun to kill things. And that's not nice, but, you know, if I want to teach a dog tricks, no, I want to do clicker training. If I want to teach a dog to do agility, that's all clicker training. I want to make all other training, you know, positive. But, I, you know, if, but if he's into... Killing things, I, I don't think you can stop that with clicker training. Two more questions. Okay. Should I take two more off the floor? Off the floor. Okay, right there. How do you feel about Monty Roberts? Monty Roberts. Um, you've got to be careful with the Monty Roberts method. You can make a horse bored going round and round and round and round and round a crowd of uh, uh, round pen too much. Um, actually, some of the stuff I really liked for starting a horse out, Pat Pirelli had some really nice tapes showing. Uh, his stuff for just first starting the horse I thought was good. People are not going to get hurt doing it. 
The other thing I liked about it is that it was very clear. Now, of course, he's trying to sell his little special halter and his little special things. You know, people always have stuff to sell. But for starting the young colt, I thought it was good. It was very clear how to do it. And you're not going to get hurt doing it. And it would gentle the, the horse. Okay? I am very concerned about inbreeding. We're making a mess out of some animals with inbreeding. How do you suggest we move as a community or a society to discourage that? Well, one of the things I know that some of the uh, different dog breeds, I mean, sometimes you've got the gene pool so narrow, the only way you could fix it is you'd have to bring some other not purebred genes in. But I am appalled at all of the stuff that's wrong with dogs. Groups or like the kennel clubs and well, I haven't done any groups of the kennel clubs, but boy, I can tell you, I've done a lot of talks where I put that bulldog up there and I've just bashed it. <laughs> because why are we breeding this deformed freak? And then you take an animal like the Sharpe. They've got so many foals in there, they're getting all of this fungus stuff and ugh, yuck. Um, I had a student that had a, she's got a Sharpe. And, uh, you know, in autism, sometimes a wheat-free diet, whereas they put the dog on a wheat-free diet, it actually helped. You know, it was just to, for, just to see if it would work, because he was bathing it in all kinds of cortisone and stuff. It was just awful. Uh, and I go, why are we breeding these problems? And I, you see, people are just kind of following the breed standard, and then new people coming in don't realize how messed up that is. I think I love to go back and look at old sports teams to see what the bulldogs looked like in the 1920s. And, you know, what does a Yale bulldog look like in 1910? It's not what a bulldog looks like now. Okay, is that, we're done? I'm afraid we're out of time for today. Um, we'll take one more on behalf of the BCSPCA. <laughs> Well, let's talk about the problem of you've got a lot of abused rescues. Let's talk a little bit about abused rescues. These animals can be very, very fearful. You've got to just work with them. It's going to just take them a long time to gradually get over it. One of my um, you know, colleagues at Colorado State had a rescue. They've had it for two years. She's now beginning to come up to people at parties. And, and they gradually, you have to work with them gently. You can get them to be less fearful. And then certain dogs have triggers. Like if you raise your hand like this, they get scared. So then if you can find that trigger and stop doing that. It's not generalizing. In other words, you've got to train now so he's relaxed around you, but new people are terrifying. You see, it, you see a lot of it, you, have to, you don't know what the history is. And sometimes you can find out the history can help solve it. But it's hard to totally undo these things. You know, and the genetics is also a factor. A dog that is naturally really nervous and high strung is going to be more damaged by rough treatment than a dog that's calmer. Same thing with horses. You're going to wreck the Arab doing a lot of rough stuff more than some calmer, fat old quarter horse, heavy boned, you know, heavy boned, thicker bodied animals tend to be uh, calmer. I found whether it's dogs or whether it's horses, that seems to be true. Well, I want to thank everybody for coming, and I will be out at that book table. <laughs>